Welcome to the show. I'm Zerlina Maxwell. We begin tonight with the death of Colin Powell. He was America's first black secretary of state and the first black chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Powell died of complications from COVID. He was fully vaccinated, but he was also immunocompromised. And we're going to look closely at what all of that means in just a few minutes. But I want to start with his life. Because when an important public figure passes away, we honor their legacy, but we can also learn something from that legacy. And at this point in our history, there is a lot we can learn from Colin Powell. He was a longtime Republican, but in 1994, he gave a commencement speech at Howard University with this message. Above all, never lose faith in America. Its faults are yours to fix, not to curse. America is a family. There may be differences and disputes within the family, but we must not allow the family to be broken into warring factions. From the diversity of our people, let us draw strength and not see weakness. Believe in America with all your heart and soul, and with all of your mind. America should not break into warring factions, but should draw strength from our diversity. Not something we hear from many Republican leaders today, is it? It's like, when's the last time you heard that from a Republican? Powell helped lead America to victory in the first Gulf War in 1991. But he's also remembered for his United Nations speech in 2003 when he laid out the case for the invasion of Iraq. And that speech helped sway many Americans who were unsure at the time about the invasion. But in the weeks and months afterward, it became clear that the U.S. intelligence about Iraq having weapons of mass destruction were false. Powell later said that realization was painful. He called the U.N. speech a permanent blot on his record. And you know, that's another lesson that we can all learn from Colin Powell. He actually expressed regret from amp about amplifying false information and false intelligence, which, you know, is not something I remember ever hearing from President George W. Bush, former Vice President Dick Cheney, or the late Donald Rumsfeld. Then in 2008, Powell broke with Republicans to endorse Barack Obama for president. He also endorsed Hillary Clinton for president in 2016. And last year, he spoke at the Democratic National Convention. Along the way, he spoke truths that few others really would. Like when he said this about Barack Obama in 2008. I'm also troubled by not what Senator McCain says, but what members of the party say. And it is permitted to be said such things as, well, you know that Mr. Obama is a Muslim. Well, the correct answer is he is not a Muslim. He's a Christian. He's always been a Christian. But the really right answer is, what if he is? Is there something wrong with being a Muslim in this country? The answer is no, that's not America. Is there something wrong with some 70 year old Muslim American kid? believing that he or she could be president. Yet I have heard senior members of my own party drop this suggestion. He's a Muslim and he might be associated with terrorists. Obama's not a Muslim, but so what if he was? I don't even think Democratic leaders were daring to say that out loud in 2008. Another black American trailblazer, Vice President Kamala Harris summed up his legacy today. He was the epitome of what it means to be strong, but at the same time, so modest in terms of everything that he did and said in a way that it was never about him. It was about the country and it was about the people who served with him. Starting us off tonight is retired Lieutenant General Russell Honore. He served as the commander of the Joint Task Force Katrina under the Bush administration. And Colin Powell, he just... He wasn't just an important figure in history, but someone with a deep moral conscience. And I think his legacy is so strong in my mind today. Lay out what you see as the, the most important thing about that legacy. You know, after uh, the shock of hearing of his death, a smile came to my face for having known this great man. Mm. And to have walked in the shadows and to walk through the ceilings uh, that he broke as I grew up in the Army. I first met him when I was a captain and he was a brigadier general. 
But that being said, uh, General Powell unequivocally is the general of our time. And I think we get one of those about every century and he owns the 21st century. He taught us what generalship should be. He was a statesman of extraordinary capacity to take the complex and for the American people to understand it. He was a great warrior in that he developed a strategy uh, that was clear to the American people going into Desert Storm that we were going in with overwhelming force and deployed over 500,000 soldiers, which I was one of them, uh, to Saudi Arabia to expunge Saddam Hussein from Kuwait. He was the ultimate soldier soldier. Uh, I met him at the Port of the Mom when he was the chairman, Darella. And we went a small bus and all the generals had been talking. I was a lieutenant colonel. And he said, Russ, uh, what do you need? And my job was to secure the port, feed the troops, take care of the troops, and unload hundreds of ships. I said, sir, we need telephone services. Our soldiers are going to the Saudi hotels. They're paying $30 for three minute call on an AT&T line that goes to England and go back to the United States. He said, I got it, Russ. Two days later, there were AT&T trucks in Saudi Arabia available for the troops to make call home at a nominal price before the war started. He cared about his soldiers and he mm. had a smile and a challenge for all of us to be the best that we could be and he lived that life. He is the general of our time. He is the general of the 21st century. And he taught us how to go from warrior to statesman, much like our first President General Washington. He will sit at that table with Washington. I can't give you the name of the others, but when he go to the big bivouac in the sky, he will be sitting with the tallest leaders our nations have ever produced. And I can see him in Washington there. It's only a guess who else will be sitting at that table. What do you think we can learn from his leadership? Integrity, character, uh, and he was a humble man. And he wasn't braggadocious about what you asked him a question and he answered it. Uh, and I wish I was more like him. And I guess that's the ultimate character you can give to someone because sometimes I'll give an emotional answer. He'll give the a diplomatic, straightforward, uh, unambiguous, straight up. As he told the Bush administration, you go back to Iraq, you break it, you gotta fix it. That was as clear as you could get in terms of a strategic piece that every elementary kid f could learn from their mom. You break it, you got to fix it. And that ended up, mm -hmm. as you know, uh, something we didn't follow in Afghanistan and Iraq. The other strategic piece that's still taught and will be taught for years to come uh, was the strategy on Iraq where he introduced, we'll go in big, we'll get it done, but we right now have to have a strategy to get out. Mm -hmm. And when we did that in Desert Storm, we got out. Then we went back in and then went, went to Afghanistan and we never left because he didn't, we didn't follow the Powell doctrine. When you go in, you have to have a strategy to get out. We did not have a strategy to get out of Afghanistan and we stumbled out of Afghanistan as opposed to what this army did on the first invasion of Iraq. That being said, he was the epitome of a warrior, a statesman. And I say again, to Miss Alba and the family, he is the general of this century. In terms of some of those foreign policy items you listed, you know, he's the rare politician public figure that actually expresses regret when they see a mistake that they've made. I mentioned that UN speech before the invasion of Iraq. Why do you think it's so rare for 
politicians and public figures to admit they made a mistake. Well, one of the things uh, you admire, and even the general did speak of, when you're not running for public office, you can deal with something called the truth. Hmm. And General Powell is very comfortable with the truth because he never saw himself as running for office. He saw himself as a public servant. And I think when you get to that space like Powell uh, and Martin Luther King, who might who will also be at that table, I would imagine, they tell the country what they need to hear, not what they want to hear. And politicians are more apt to tell you what you want to hear as opposed to what you need to hear. General Powell is very clear. And while that one speech, which he explained and lived with to it until this morning, regretting and explaining it to people what happened, I think he was a champion for the truth. He, he was a, 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 a band leader for truth and integrity. And when you deal with the truth, uh, that's a conflict sometimes for politicians. Again, I want to tell you what you want to hear, not what you need to hear. And he had no aspirations, per se, that I ever saw that he wanted to run for office. And when you are free of that burden, which I have for since 2008, I don't want to run for office, so I might tell you something you may not want to hear. But I've learned that from General Powell. Deal with the truth, and you'll always be on the right side of history. Deal with the truth. I like that. Lieutenant General Russell Honore, thank you so much for being here and starting us off tonight, and please stay safe. Colin Powell's death serves as a reminder as well about the importance of vaccinations. Powell died from complications due to COVID-19. Now, he was fully vaccinated, but he was also elderly, 84 years old, and immunocompromised. Powell had several underlying health conditions. He had multiple myeloma, a type of blood cancer that can weaken the body's ability to fight infections. He also had Parkinson's disease and had surgery for prostate cancer when he was Secretary of State. In short, he was precisely the type of person we are all trying to protect by getting the vaccine ourselves. Philip Bump of the Washington Post writes, quote, it seems ine inevitable in this moment that Powell's death will prompt new indifference to the vaccine as though his death somehow proves that the vaccines don't work. The lesson we should learn instead is that the vaccines work best when they work broadly and that had Powell been protected both by the vaccine and by low rates of infection in his community, he might still be alive. Joining me now is Dr. Kavita Patel. She's the former White House Health Policy Director under the Obama administration and an, MS an NBC News medical contributor. Excuse me. Dr. Patel, explain to us why General Powell is an example of why we should get vaccinated and not why the vaccine doesn't work. Yeah, Serlina, it's exactly as uh, Philip wrote and you commented. Number one, vaccines really do work when a population, a community, an entire group of people get vaccinated. We talked about herd immunity kind of earlier in the pandemic. This is really what herd immunity references, that the more people out of 100 people, if 90 people are vaccinated, it can protect even those 10 that either are not vaccinated or in the case of General Powell, he was not able to probably mount a sufficient immune response because of those chronic conditions you mentioned. We know that persons with multiple myeloma uh, compared to healthy people achieve anywhere from half of the effectiveness of COVID-19 vaccines or lower. So they're just coming out of this fully vaccinated as he was, but not anywhere near, Zerlina, what a healthy, even healthy 84-year-old might be able to mount. So that's why everybody around is critical. And honestly, it's a good reminder that this virus is still incredibly active and incredibly opportunistic in places where we have lower vaccination rates, as well as lower numbers of people who have an appropriate immune response. And it's, a, it's also a reminder of why we're talking about boosters and third doses as well. So one of the things that I keep seeing come up is 
this goes back to when you know the president announced that if you're if you're vaccinated, you don't need a mask outside. I remember that moment because a lot of people were like, "We told you, you weirdos out here walking around with a mask on. Don't you know you don't need that? Why are you being such a wimp?" Um, and I always like to remind people that number one, you you can't tell if someone has an immuno is immunocompromised by looking at them. Um, and two, you don't know if they live with someone who's immunocompromised. Can we just sort of, for the record, like, put a marker down <laughs> and explain to people why, like, if you see people out of the grocery store with masks on, you should not judge right. them. They could live with somebody who has, you yes. know, it, it is immunocompromised. Absolutely. At least 4% of the United States falls into these categories of people with chronic conditions. And Zerlina, honestly, it's even higher than that, most likely, when you take into account people who are elderly, people who are recovering from another illness. This is exactly the population. And you're talking about it. And Zerlina, we don't walk around with a big scarlet letter that says, I live with someone or I have an immunocompromised condition. I bet most people watching and seeing the general on television or at speaking events would never know that he had gone through a number of these battles with serious chronic conditions. So you're absolutely right that, uh, in fact, my patients that have had solid organ transplants for which they are considered immunocompromised, mm -hmm. I have had to give them the bad news that they need to have their household wear masks, exactly to your point, and that they, no matter what the CDC says, they are going to continue to need to keep taking precautions, even though they've had three doses, not just two, three doses of vaccines. So you're right to remind us we have to celebrate what vaccine do, but we also have to remember that not everybody gets that layer of protection. And especially as early, I hate to be the bearer of bad news. We're still only at about 58% of the entire country. That includes children. So 58% of the country being vaccinated. We have a long way to go to give the protection to the general pals of the country. So if we have a long way to go, are we supposed to do Thanksgiving this year, Halloween, Christmas? Like last year, remember, it was pretty clear. It was like, right. stay home with the people in your household. Do, don't do Thanksgiving. This year, it seems unclear because right. of people like General Powell and also because people are going to spend time with family members. And sometimes that includes elderly parents or grandparents. I think you hit the nail on the head. You have to think about who you're spending time with. A couple of things. We do have much more data around children being able to safely trick or treat outdoors, especially with their space. You know, it's actually perfect if you can have your kind of children, uh, you know, separated from all the other trick or treaters by going door to door, but not by coming up close and close contact. And children can wear masks as part of their costume. So that actually can work. But I think to your point, Thanksgiving, holidays, Hanukkah, anything where you might have an un vaccinated household member or someone who is at high risk strongly urged to consider either quarantining before you travel, wearing masks indoors where appropriate. And then Zerlina, we're finally able to talk about testing, making sure maybe people even get like a rapid test. It's, you can't test out of COVID as a reminder, but it can offer, if you're doing it with a household, offer layers of protection and reassurances. So my message for Thanksgiving Get together if your vaccinated household can talk about doing it safely. That is a world of difference from a year ago. We couldn't talk about this because we didn't have vaccines, mm. but we still have to be safe. It's a really good point. Rapid tests are, are a good thing to have around the house. It's just good to sometimes check in, <laughs> make sure everything is good. Dr. Kavita Patel, thank you so much for being here tonight, and please stay safe. Coming up, justice for Armand Arbery. Jury selection began today in Georgia for the trial of the three men charged with his murder. We'll get into that next. After mom was killed, I had lots and lots of questions but no answers. We went 74 days without an arrest. But um, today I'm very, very thankful that I reached this stage in the case where we're going to pick a jury. The family of Ahmed Arbery is finally getting their day in court. Jury selection has formally begun in the case that have, some have described as a modern day lynching in Brunswick, Georgia. Video released last year showed Travis McMichael and his father, Greg, in a truck following Arbery before cornering him, confronting him, and then fatally shooting him. The McMichaels have said they thought Arbery was a burglar responsible for a series of recent thefts in the area. His family says he was just out on a run, which is something I do almost every day. 
It took the release of that video nearly three months after Arbery's death for the McMichaels, as well as a third man who filmed the incident to be arrested and charged with aggravated assault, false imprisonment, and murder. That delay is part of the reason the first district attorney to oversee the case is now facing criminal charges all her own. Arbery's death alongside that of George Floyd served as a catalyst for the Black Lives Matter movement and racial reckoning last year. And his death, like George Floyd's, was recorded and quickly went viral after going public. The question now is, will Arbery's case, like George Floyd's, did end with a conviction? Joining me now is MSNBC legal analyst and attorney Katie Fang. So Katie, this trial is taking place in, the, in a southern, predominantly white city, when you consider consider the jury pool, what do you think is going to happen here in terms of how the prosecution is going to handle this? Who has the tougher job, the prosecution or the defense? I think it's always going to be the prosecution that's going to have the toughest job. And the reason why is partially because your potential jury pool is going to already be predisposed one way or another. We know, Zerlina, that there were 1,000 prospective jurors that received jury notice summonses, but 600 were ordered to appear today. They were ordered to a local gymnasium, um, and then the judge started bringing them 20 at a time. But the reason why it's always gonna be hard and tougher for the prosecution is the prosecution in a criminal case has the burden of proof. Um, the burden of proof to uh, take the evidence and make sure that they can prove each and every element of the crimes that are charged against each and every one of those defendants, and they have to prove it beyond and to the exclusion of every reasonable doubt. So jury selection becomes critical because you wanna make sure that any preconceived notions, biases, prejudices, that they're left at the door, that you truly have a fair and impartial jurist that's going to sit there, listen to the facts, listen to the law as the judge explains it to you as the juror, and apply the facts of this specific case to the law. So the prosecution's always going to have the uphill battle in a criminal case. But when you have things like videographic evidence, like we have in this case, when you also have things like um, one of the defendants um, testifying that he overheard the co-defendant stating a racial epithet right after Mr. Arbery was murdered, I mean, that's some pretty compelling evidence, too. So it's definitely going to be an interesting trial. It's going to take at least a couple of weeks. But right now, we have to get a jury of 12 seated with a minimum of four alternates just in case something happens. Don't forget, as we all know, we're still in the time of COVID. We have these prospective mm -hmm. jurors wearing masks. It's a lot more difficult to do a jury trial these days than it did pre-pandemic. That's a really interesting point and good point. Um, in this case, we have video, which is similar to the case of George Floyd. Um, but at the time, Georgia had this citizen's arrest law that the defense is using to justify the shooting. Tell us about this law. Will that work? So that law has since been repealed. But yes, it is a defense that the defendants are relying upon. And it, it's, it's an antiquated law. It's a vestige from a Civil War era, right? It's this idea that if you had a crime committed and you were aware of it, or it was a committed in your awareness surroundings, then you were able to affect a citizen's arrest. Well, you can imagine what, what type of trouble, what type of murder it invite to allow a citizen to be able to do that. And that's exactly the reason why um, it was a bipartisan move to be able to repeal that law. But you, know, you have to look at the specific facts and circumstances of each case. Did those defendants act reasonably, even in the parameters or even in that construct of that citizen's arrest law? Were their actions reasonable? Did it really seem feasible that in the middle of the day, you have an African-American man jogging in broad daylight down the street? Did he really just commit a burglary? I mean, these are the types of questions that the prosecution is going to ask the jurors to have to consider and have them say, you know what? That was not reasonable, and it definitely was not what should have been done by the defendants in this case, and it certainly should not have resulted in two out of the three of them arming themselves with a handgun and a shotgun, getting into trucks, and then driving down, mowing down, and hunting down Mr. Arbery as he was jogging and trying to flee, trying to flee from these men. 
It occurred to me rather recently that in some ways this case reminds me of Trayvon Martin. And the reason why is because there's this weird law that the, de that the defendants can use um, to say, it was fine that I killed this person because here's my defense. Um, and in a lot of ways, sort of like following somebody with the assumption that that person is a threat isn't that based on the premise that like black men are a threat? I don't think if Armand Arbery was a woman or a white person, that any of those assumptions and the need to even utilize this as a defense would even seem reasonable at all. So your instincts are spot on. I actually beg to differ. I think if it was an African-American woman, still would have happened in these particular you know, circumstances. But that's the reason why jury selection is so important. There was a pre-trial juror questionnaire that was sent out that was asking the jurors generally, where do you get your information from? Where do you get your news from? What are kind of your preconceived ideas about this case? What do you know about the Ahmad Arbery case, right? And then the attorneys are allowed to ask questions of prospective jurors about what's your take on the Confederate flag? We know that the McMichaels mm. had a Confederate flag license plate. What's your take on racial epithets? Is it okay to use? You know, what's your take on the Black Lives Matter movement? And so that's the reason why we have to rely, it's almost this um, social contract, right? This idea that we rely upon you as a prospective juror to tell the truth and tell us the truth about what you think about these things so that you can be the appropriate juror to sit on this case. You may not be the right jury for this case, but you may be the right juror for another case, but we wanna make sure as the lawyers that you're being honest about what your beliefs are so that you can sit in fair impartiality. Let's hope people are being honest about that. Maybe that's one of the lessons of the, the late, great General Colin Powell, and I think a theme of the night. Katie Fang, thank you so much for joining me tonight, and please stay safe. So today, the twice impeached ex-president, Donald Trump, remember him? He finally answered questions under oath. But this wasn't anything related to the January 6th attack on the Capitol or the 2020 election and interference in that election or anything related to his time in the White House. No, this was a deposition in a civil lawsuit dating back to his first presidential bid. The suit stems from a 2015 incident where a group of people say they were assaulted physically by members of Trump's security staff while protesting outside of Trump Tower in New York City. They want the former president to be held personally liable. The deposition today was ordered by a judge after Trump and his lawyers canceled or delayed the deposition several times. So Donald Trump is basically back to what he was doing before the presidency, getting sued, suing people, and testifying at depositions. It's like his favorite thing to do. This is just one of a long list of mounting civil cases against Donald Trump, with allegations including at least four lawsuits related to the insurrection on January 6th, sexual assault claims, def defamation, and fraud, just for good measure. And now that Donald Trump is out of the White House, he can't hide behind uh, the pres presidential seal to avoid confronting these legal claims. And joining me now to break this all down is former federal prosecutor Glenn Kirshner. He's also an MSNBC legal analyst. And Glenn, it's like, that's a lot of lawsuits. <laughs> so an attorney for the plaintiff talked to the media right after Trump's deposition. Today. Let's take a listen to that and I'll get your reaction on the other side. The former president sat and uh, was examined for several hours on the incident that occurred right around the corner here on September 3rd, 2015. The president was exactly as you would expect him to be, uh, and uh, he answered questions the way that you would expect uh, Mr. Trump to answer questions, and uh, conducted himself in a manner that you would expect Mr. Trump to conduct himself. Glenn, give us some background on this particular case that Donald Trump is getting deposed in today. How do you think it will go? Um, and do you think it'll make it to a trial? You know, I suspect if Donald Trump answered questions the way we would expect him to answer questions, I thought the law lawyer was very restrained in his response. Um, what we know, because we have seen Donald Trump answer questions in other depositions that were ultimately released, he can't answer a question directly with a truthful, honest answer. He's evasive, he's combative, he's dismissive, he's insulting. We've seen him answer questions with, you're harassing me with your question. Here's what I, I suspect will happen, Zerlina. The tape that was created today of this deposition is probably a horror show of Donald Trump bad behavior, and it will all but guarantee 
that the case will settle without going to trial. This case stems from a 2015 incident which was caught on tape in part a protest outside of Trump Tower where Keith Schiller, the head of Trump's security, assaulted a protester and confiscated the protester's property. So the core question about which Donald Trump was examined today is, does Donald Trump and the Trump Organization condone or authorize hmm. violence against rally goers or protesters? We've all seen Donald Trump at his rallies. The answer to that question is inarguably yes. So I can't imagine Trump or Trump's lawyers will want today's videotape put in front of a jury to see, you know, how it is he performed. So we went over the long list of civil cases filed against former President Trump. Do you expect him to be deposed again in the future? There's a lot. I mean, that's a lot of cases. He's got a lot of cases. <laughs> Yeah, I think you're going to see deposition after deposition after deposition. Why? Because he no longer has the shield of the presidency to hold up, saying, mm -hmm. I'm just too darn busy running the country, in reality, playing golf, so I can't be forced to sit for civil depositions. But, you know, here's the thing, Zerlina. Depositions uh, take place thousands of times every day across the country. And generally, um, people don't um, always behave that well in depositions. They're... There's no judge there. There's no referee there. And people are prone to lie in depositions. Usually that goes unaddressed. But you know when sometimes people take note or the system takes note is when the person being deposed is high profile or notorious in some way. Because just look at when Bill Clinton sat for a deposition and testified the way he testified. He actually was held accountable, perhaps more than he deserved. But in any event, held accountable for his testimony at a deposition beyond the four corners of that case. So I, you know, I wouldn't discount that whatever Donald Trump said today, assuming it wasn't truthful, might come back to haunt him. Let's hope that he learned how to tell the truth since his time in the White House. Um, before you go, there's a little bit of breaking news. As I mentioned, Donald Trump not only is somebody who gets sued a lot, but he's also somebody that likes to sue. He's now suing the January 6th committee and the National Archives in an attempt to block access to documents. He's again citing executive privilege. Break that down for us. What, what's he doing here? So I think he's trying to delay. He's trying to do what he so often does, weaponize the delay inherent in the court system to try to run out the clock. You know, he tried to run out the clock on impeachment. He tried to run out the clock on the civil litigation in New York. Um, I, I think at this point, he's gonna try to run out the clock on the select committee investigation into the January 6th insurrection. I don't think this is a strong executive privilege claim. So I have a feeling that hopefully the courts will have learned their lesson and will not let a nefarious litigant weaponize the delay in the system. Let's hope they address this and resolve it expeditiously. And I think they will resolve it against Donald Trump's claim of executive privilege. Glenn Kirshner, it's always great to have you here from Mini Law School. Thank you so much for being here. I mean, I feel like my law degree, I never used it, but Donald Trump made it relevant. Thank you, I guess. <laughs> Please stay safe. Coming up, it's redistricting season as parties drop uneven playing fields in the states across the country. I'll talk to a Democratic congressman who was almost the victim of this partisan ploy. We'll be right back. I believe in giving you guys value. We have spent months preparing you for the next big political fight, redistricting. That's when state legislatures use census data to create congressional maps. The political party in power usually controls that process. Well, what does that mean in Texas? It means that Democrats had to fight to stop Republicans from implementing a map that had two longtime congressional Democrats going up against each other. Congressman Al Green and Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee. They're both black, they're both Democrats, and they were the only two representatives in the whole state of Texas who found themselves in that particular situation. Representative Green told me last week that the message was clear. There is little means by which one can deny that there's a racial aspect to this. Uh, I know what racism looks like, 
I know what it smells like, I know what it tastes like, I know what it sounds like, and I know what it hurts like. And there is an element of racism associated with what's happening here. That message may have struck a chord because over the weekend, Democrats were able to get Republicans to accept a compromise map that will largely keep Greens and Jackson Lee's districts separate. So crisis averted for now. But that was just one of several concerns Democrats had with the Republican controlled process. And joining me now is Texas Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee. Congresswoman, how were you and your colleague, Representative Al Green, able to convince Texas Republicans to leave your districts alone? Did they get the message that their maps, like uh, your colleague said, were basically racist? Selena, first of all, thank you for having me and allow me, first of all, to indicate my uh, deep sympathy uh, for the family of General slash Secretary of State Colin Powell, first African-American Secretary of State of Jamaican parents uh, and someone who loved this country and stood for what I believe this country should be standing for, and that is a country of all people uh, with equality for all. My deepest sympathy to his wife and his family. Thank you for allowing me to do that. I can only say to you that the results of what we have seen has come from unity between myself and Congressman Al Green, has come from the people, uh, and come from the conspicuousness of racial gerrymandering that could not be ignored. And certainly outstanding Texas black state legislators and Democrats who really stood up and worked with Republicans, to be very honest with you, to understand if there was no purpose to this gerrymandering, uh, then it had to be based on racial gerrymandering. And I think because of leaders like Representative Symphonia Thompson and Harold Dutton and Rep. Ron Reynolds and the entire uh, Legislative Black Caucus, along with other Democrats, they understood. And of course, the chairman of the redistricting committee uh, in the uh, House uh, saw their argument, but you know what? They saw over a hundred people that in a matter of less than 24 hours that we got the notice that there was gonna be a hearing because we weren't even expecting this to go at this point. And that these Houstonians, these Texans, crowded up, loaded up the virtual testimony line. Some stayed on for 12 hours, some never got on, but they were heard over and over again, no an opposition that was loud and strong because we were not afraid, we were not to be undermined, we were not gonna be silenced, and we were gonna stand up for Barbara Jordan's district that I've had the privilege of serving in for a number of years. For so many people out there, redistricting is a confusing, wholly unsexy topic. It's something that we, we were like, <laughs> you know, fill out your census, this matters, this is so important. But often people sort of, you know, their eyes sort of, sort of get glossed over when we're talking about it. How do you explain to your own constituents what's at stake with redistricting, especially in a state like yours, where Republicans control the process and make it so partisan? Thank you so very much for that question. It's about the power. Frederick Douglass said, there is no power without a struggle. And frankly, the tools of voter suppression and oppression, which by the way, I said to Senator Manchin, we needed to hurry up and pass the John Robert Lewis bill because if we had had it uh, and signed by the president, we would not have had this because pre-clearance would have been in place. But it is the power. Mm -hmm. And what Republicans have found out is that the easy way to secure power if you cannot defeat people at the ballot box is for the seats to disappear. I'm very glad that the kind of uh, effort uh, and urgency that the people expressed uh, we showed that the district does not belong to one member or another. It belongs to the people. And uh, Barbara Jordan, when she get, first got elected after the 1965 Voting Rights Act, the concept was for the first time, African-Americans in Texas were able to vote for a person of their choosing, of their vote, since Reconstruction. I have said that over and over. I said that when we were fighting. I said that when we went to testify, that you have extinguished, eliminated, denied the right for African-Americans, people of color, to choose a person of their choice, including Hispanics, Asians, and others. I hope they have gotten a message for the long term. I hope they feel good about what has happened today, meaning those who are in power. Because uh, power 
begets nothing but suppression if you use it in the wrong way. And to keep people from choosing their choice is the wrong way. That was our message, and I hope it was heard. I believe it was heard. I believe they understood that racial gerrymandering is not part of democracy. You mentioned Senator Joe Manchin. Was he receptive to your comment about the urgency of passing a federal voting rights bill now? He was. Um, it has to be reignited because uh, we're now on October 18th, 2021, months after the conversation that he had uh, with the fleeing uh, Democrats from Texas who left their homes. Now people understand the cruciality of what they did and the sacrifice. They were trying to fight against this horrible uh, voting bill that is the worst in the nation and made Texas the number one state that is the hardest to vote in the nation, but also that redistricting was coming up. And I, I think it's important. You made a very valid point. Boring, but it is an epidemic. It's going to be an epidemic across mm -hmm. America. The tools are going to be used by Republican legislatures in terms of how do you eliminate seats that may happen to be people of color or those who are uh, voting. I hope they can take a lesson from what we did working together here in Texas in these last minutes. And I hope there's some sense of accomplishment that there was a coming together over the fact that this might not just be the right thing to do, to pair two African-Americans together, two Democrats together. And I think our unity between the two members of Congress really showed them something that we were not gonna be pitted against each other. We were not gonna stand against each other. We were not gonna talk about whose district they should keep and uh, backroom deals. We did everything in the open. We opened it to our constituents. We prayed, we rallied, we spoke. And we told our constituents that silence is not an option. I hope this is a protocol across the nation because it's going to be used across the nation by legislatures controlled uh, by the opposite party over and over again. Again, I want to say to Texas, you've done the right thing. If this goes all the way through, let's see whether this can be a prototype for what is right. I want to switch gears a bit. Today, the Justice Department, for the second time, asked the Supreme Court to block the enforcement of Texas's new abortion ban. The court declined to get involved the first time. Are you optimistic at all that this time will be different than the first time? You know, I want to respect the three branches of government, the executive, the legislature uh, and the judiciary. But you know, there's some times when uh, you have to speak out against the legislature, speak up and help the executive, particularly if they're your party, collaborate with them to do right. And then if it's the Supreme Court, the highest court in the land, where I know that my destiny was intertwined during the midst of the civil rights movement, the marches of Dr. King, they had no one else to rely on in those early years, but the Supreme Court uh, and the Justice Department. So now here's my message. To the Supreme Court, women may die. Women who are poor do not have access to abortion in the state of Texas, and there are other legislatures looking to be copycats. There is a bounty protocol in this state that may cause someone, again, to lose their life, similar to the bounty on slaves, where a private citizen, slick as the state thought they were, could seek after a woman seeking medical care, health care, abortion rights and receive $10,000. That is inhumane, it is obscene. The Supreme Court cannot hide behind standing or procedure. Do your job and look at this case and this law and analyze it as it relates to two aspects, the Constitution and the Ninth Amendment and Roe v. Wade. In both instances, this is patently unconstitution, unconstitutional, it must stop immediately and I beg of you, save lives. Don't send young women and women with families and others who need to make decisions with their, uh, their provider, their health provider, their God, their family, into back alleys like they were 20 and 30 years ago or 40 years ago. Let us do the right thing. And to the Supreme Court, the highest body in the land that makes a final uh, decision on right and wrong and holds up the precious rights of the most vulnerable in our nation, please do your job. Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee, it's great to have you tonight again. Please stay safe. Thank you so much. Before we go to break, 
Pope Francis got a lot of attention over the weekend when he spoke out and called for reforms in a number of industries. He also said this about the pandemic. La pandemia transparentó las desigualdades sociales que azotan a nuestros pueblos. Again, that was the Pope saying the pandemic has laid bare the social inequalities that afflict our peoples. He called on companies to release the patents for COVID vaccines. The Pope also said, in the name of God, I ask financial groups and international credit institutions to allow poor countries to assure the basic needs of their people. In the name of God, I ask the great ex extractive industries to stop deforesting, destroying forests, wetlands, and mountains. And he said, in the name of God, I ask technology giants to stop exploiting human weakness, people's vulnerability, for the sake of profits. The Pope is scheduled to meet with President Biden at the Vatican on October the 29th. And it seems like they may have some things to talk about. That is like my jam. I, th I feel like he read the Bible. It's just, just a hunch. Coming up, Cinema and Mansion, two names I really can't believe I still have to talk about so much. Annoying. Why are these two Democrats blocking the Democratic Party's agenda all the time at every turn? It's all about the Benjamins. We'll be right back. So here we are, yet again, talking about Senators Kirsten Sinema and Senator Joe Manchin. Truthfully, I am tired of talking about these two Democrats. But we have to because they have made a point of dominating the conversation. So we have no choice but to talk about them. So here it goes. In the fight to pass the Build Back Better agenda, Manchin and Sinema are calling for a smaller and a slimmer plan because of the hard line they've drawn in the sand. Progressives have to give up a lot more because of these two and how they refuse to budge. And you know, you might be at home and be like, why do they refuse to budge? Well, it's all about the money. Senators Manchin and Cinema are worried that if they fall in line with their Democratic co colleagues, they'll lose out on that corporate lobbying money or dark money. And if you don't believe me, just listen to Congressman Jamal Bowman. We are a part of a system that is rooted in white supremacy. And it has evolved into a system where corporate backed actors and the wealthy elite are literally controlling Congress. But Bowman isn't the only progressive speaking out. Over the weekend, Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio Cortez called cinema out for putting corporate lobbyists over people. She tweeted, it's insulting to tell everyday people who work tirelessly for a majority in the Senate that they must suffer insane drug prices, no voting rights, and climate disaster for political convenience. And joining me now is Eugene, ja Eugene Daniels. He's a White House correspondent for Politico and an MSNBC contributor. And Eugene, explain dark money for us, for the uninitiated at home. What does it mean, and what should the average voter know about it? Yeah, I mean, it is one of those things where we don't have to know exactly where the money's coming from. And it is something that was only allowed from some for, from a Supreme Court case years ago. And it's something that people don't talk a ton about. You hear a lot about it from the left, right? You hear a lot of that conversation happening with Democrats. You hear a lot of it um, with progressives because it one of the issues that they say they have with it, and a lot of people do, is that you if you don't know where the money's coming from, you don't know who is accessing, possibly controlling members of Congress, your other lawmakers. And that is the biggest issue. And that's what voters should know about it. And one of the things um, that we all know, you, we, we've been covering these things for years, is that, you know, who gives the most money a lot of the times has the most access and then also has the most say, right? And that is a lot of what um, people have issues with when it comes to dark money. Because the money's just coming from, you know, you and your parents, where you're giving $28 to your lawmaker, um, um, that's one thing. But then when this person is giving um, in uns all types of money that is not always regulated, um, then they get a say or they get some influence over whom um, with the decisions that are being made in this country. 
So I, I want to break it down even further because I think it's important to start sort of with that definition, but then also explain and unpack for people how the dark money is affecting this infrastructure uh, negotiation that is going on currently. So you see Senator Manchin getting called out for his connection to the fossil fuel industry and energy companies. And then you have Kirsten Sinema getting called out for her connection to big pharma. Talk about how the money from those two industries may, I don't know if it's certainly true, because I, I, I don't know what's in their brains, but may influence where they stand on some of these policy questions that are coming up during these negotiations. Yeah, I mean, for Joe Manchin, right, his state is the second largest U.S. coal producer, um, relies on fuel for, I think, 90 percent, 91 percent of his energy needs, and the energy sector is six percent of the state's employment. So that's one thing. So he is already from a state that is so involved in this. But also, according to his own financial disclosure last year, he received about $492,000 in dividends um, in a, for a coal business he started in 1988. And he's currently the top recipient of donations from the oil and gas and, and coal mining um, industries um, this election cycle. And we reported at Politico that Cinema received $27,800 from packs of pharmaceutical companies from July through September. And so what that means is um, whether or not, and this is something that happened a lot during the 2016 election. I don't know if you guys can remember that far, but the conversation about like, just because you someone gives someone money, does that mean they control them, right? Like, what can you point to? Um, a decision that was made, um, the influence that was given. And with this um, infrastructure and this Build Back Better agenda, because it's not a bill just yet, um, we're seeing that, one, Joe Manchin has talked a lot about how um, he um, is, is unsure about some of the climate change provisions that are in there, including um, $150 billion um, that a lot of climate activists say is necessary to help move this country from you know, his state's largest, one of his state's largest producer of, of coal from that industry into more green um, areas in, in, in this country. And I think that tells you a lot, right? Like you get all this money, you have all these connections, and then the decision is made to do this. It may be that they truly believe, right? That like he truly believes that um, in coal and that it's good and all of that, but the, they don't really say that, right? So the connection there for folks um, is, is easy to be made. The other piece of this, and we only have one more minute, but the other piece of this, and you mentioned 2016, is that a lot of people talk about the Russia attack on the election because of the emails and the hacking. But foreign money, not just from Russia, but other sources as well, is ending up in our elections because of the same uh, Supreme Court decision you mentioned, Citizens United. Talk about just quickly, if we're going to get any insight into that, like, should we know that? That, that sounds bad. Foreign money in elections. You would... <laughs> You would think that that Americans would want to know people that you know that people foreign actors are, are giving money to whomever um, members of Congress, <laughs> someone who was running for president um, into our elections, and that's something that activists especially are always pushing for. And this is something that Congress could do, right? Congress could take a lot of this on and has attempted to do and has talked about it and attempted to do that with some of their election reform um, bills that they have tried to put forth. You know, the problem is there's not enough support to make that happen. And I think I think everyone agrees that foreign interaction <laughs> in our elections is bad, no matter how it happens and almost no matter who, it, who it's from, um, and especially putting money in, because then we definitely don't know who it's mm -hmm. coming from, right? And I think that is something that activists um, are still pushing. I don't know how close they're getting to m making sure that kind of stuff doesn't happen. This is a helpful conversation. You know, the folks at home, you're a regular voter. You don't have thousands and thousands of dollars to donate to Senator Kirsten Sinema. But I want you to know at home that that is happening. And in order to reform the system, to make it a little bit more equitable to the average American voter, you know, we got to elect people that talk about this, like Congressman Jamal Bowen, for example. If you agree with him, you need more folks like that in the Congress to make these reforms Eugene was talking about. Eugene Daniels. Hi, I'm Zerlina Maxwell. Thanks for checking out our channel on YouTube. You can see more from Zerlina by clicking any of the videos on this screen and make sure you subscribe below to stay up to date on the day's biggest stories. Thanks for watching.